Hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Garrett and today's session is extremely different because on one level, my guest on today's program has been the subject of much controversy for speaking the basic truth of our Christian faith. On the other hand, while speaking from a place of love that is rarely explained or understood in the media by the media, her statements are often extremely divisive to those who are not Christians who don't pay attention. The one all-encompassing thing that she said that resonates around the globe today in more countries than just in England is this. I never imagined that my skills as a lawyer would be used to defend Christians for following their faith in 21st century Britain. I often say, if you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. Well, Andrea Williams stands for much. And whether you agree or disagree, I find her to be a fascinating advocate for Christians to live as freely as anyone else in this world that I believe God created. You know, and, and so I wanted to start, before we get into so many, so many things we could talk about, I wanted to talk about how you came to faith. Yes, and really that story uh, goes right back to the very beginning of my life. Although my parents at that time uh, weren't Christians, a bus from the local church, the local Methodist church, came and picked up all the children from our area and I was put on the bus and I went to Sunday school and there Mrs Hibbs, she told me all about Jesus. So I was only four and I fell in love with Jesus there and then and I can't remember not loving Jesus. When I was seven, my next Sunday school teacher, Mrs Hicks, told me that the best present I could ever have was a Bible and to, to read my Bible every day. And I did exactly what Mrs Hicks told me. I went home, I asked for a Bible and I was given a Bible. And almost every day from that day to this, I've read my Bible. So as a little girl, I just absorbed everything uh, that um, I was being told in Sunday school. I thank God that my sister became a Christian through the same method and my brother and my parents followed. And so all of this is absolutely wonderful. Wow. So that was how, so right at the beginning, this is why I think it's so important uh, that certainly that we as Christians in the church um, educate our children really well, keep our children with us, educate them in the faith, but also that we're open to bringing, up, bringing in, other, in others because there certainly could be another little girl out there just like me and of course. Oh, I totally understand that because my husband and I get used all the time as spiritual parents or spiritual mentors yeah. to so many young people. Yes. And it started when my son went to college, Yeah, you know? Um, so I, I, I guess then you sort of, you grew up with a love and a respect of faith yes. and a freedom to practice your yes, faith. Yes, I was just a little girl, but I think, again, just looking at how the Lord uh, unfolds life, which is how I come to be doing what I'm doing now. I loved him then, and I was just a child, and I loved him very simply. Uh, but then when I was eight, I watched a, a legal program on the television. And I said to my, I was home from school with chicken box. And I said to my mother, and I can remember it exactly, it was lunchtime, the program was on at lunchtime. And I said to my mum, when I grow up, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm never going to change my mind. Wow. Yeah. And so that night I went, as every night I did, I used to go down and pray by the side of my bed. I had bunk beds with my sister. Wow. And I prayed this prayer, I prayed the prayer I prayed every night, God bless mum, God bless dad, God bless nanny and granddad and Sam the cat. I had a prayer, amen. And then after that I said, and dear Lord Jesus, if it is your will, please may I pass the 11 plus so that I can go to the grammar school so that I can become a barrister. Because I figured that the only way that a little girl like me uh, could become a barrister, a lawyer, would be if I passed this 11 plus and went to this school, this particular school, yeah. Um, because I figured that then a little girl like me from my background would have a chance at going to university and becoming a lawyer. My, my desire to go to law school was yep. always rooted in, you know, kind of like you saw someone helping someone. Yep. You know, I wanted to, uh, and, I, and I'm still, I, I guess, that way in what yeah, I do. Yeah. I wanted to champion the rights of the underdog. Yes. You know, I never thought that Christian rights could ever be an underdog. That's right. You, you know, which leads me, I guess, to, um, I want to share this story with you before I, I really get into how on earth you became a defender of Christian yeah. rights in 21st century Britain. But I got to tell you, you know, a woman walked up to me at a fellowship in California uh, a few weeks ago, 
complete and total stranger. I'd never seen her before. And she came up to me and she said, I have a word from God for you. And I remember looking at her thinking, and I was a bit distracted in my head with the 29 things I had to do. And I thought, a word from God for me. I, I paid half attention, but I thought, yep. well, I should pay attention. That's rather an interesting in yes. for someone to come to you and say, I have a word yeah, from yeah, God for you. Yeah. And she said, God showed me a picture of you scouring up and down a list, like with, with a pencil in your hand. You were looking up and down a list for people that you were going to talk to. And I looked at her. Now, at this point, I started paying attention because unbeknownst to her, weeks prior, I had Googled the 100 most influential Christians in the UK. And I just Googled it just to see what came up so that when I was going about putting together the next sessions, the next season of these sessions, I, I might understand who in the UK is doing what and yeah. saying what. And I, did, and I was looking up and down that list, trying to decide, well, who would I ask? Because it was a list, uh, Archbishop Cromer, I think it yeah. was. You know, it said, I didn't know who he was. Yeah, it, yeah. it took an English friend to explain yes. that to me, you know? But, but I, I put the list aside because I thought, well, I wouldn't, I don't know where to start and I don't yeah. know any of these people. So I put the list down. Three weeks later, this woman walks up to me, a total stranger and says, I see you looking up and down this list. God said, go to the bottom of the list. There's a woman there that's going to be a guest on your show. Wow. And he, he's meant for her to be there. Wow. I went back to this list. Now, at the bottom of this list was the vicar, Andrew White, and Dan Walker. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W, yes, right? that's right. And I'm at the bottom. But I said, but God, you said it was a woman. Well, in order to test God on this, I did a Gideon, and I said, I'm going to throw out the fleece and see, God, if, if this is really you, then I'm going to reach out to all three of these people, but... If it's the woman, then it will be the woman and not the men who have the ability to do this this season. Well, I sent an email to you straight in the middle of the night <laughs> and you answered right away. And I, I really wanted to share that story with you and with all of you watching because I think that you have to understand when God is saying, for such a time as this, I want my anointed to speak. So I really have been looking forward to this show because I know God put his well, seal of that's, approval on it's it. It's been absolutely wonderful to get to know you, even in these few minutes coming into this wonder, these wonderful studios here. And I'm just praying that God will continue to really increase the work that's all around here, but also that we uh, speak increasingly of his love and of his justice and his righteousness, the righteousness that flows from him, not just into the great Great Britain, but, but well, across the world, indeed, across the world. Yes. Now, let's start kind of with how, how did you become, and you became an attorney. Yes. God gave you your dream. Yeah. I have to believe that little did you know that he was also preparing you. Yeah, not at that time. So the end of the story, so it's, it's, it was interesting. So there's the little girl there in faith. And at 15, I went to a missions conference, a youth conference. Mm. And, I stood, and I stood up and I said, Lord Jesus, I am surrendered. I want my every moment to count. I'll go wherever you have me go. I'll do whatever you'll have me do. But please, can I still be a lawyer? Right. <laughs> so I really wanted to be a lawyer. Um, but it was, a, it was a mo as if I was moving from childhood faith into adult faith. And I went on and I studied um, law and Italian at university. I then was called to the Inns of Court School of Law and I practiced as a barrister, so around the Crown Courts mainly mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom for eight years in my 20s. Um, and during that time, I also pioneered the student work and the policy work of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. And it was really there that I began to f see that our laws during the Blair Brown years, um, based on human rights legislation, which is, of course is based on human reason, as opposed to our great common law tradition that we have in this country, which refers really to the common law is God's law, mm -hmm. is actually biblical law. That's what the reference, what, that's what centuries of law is rooted in mm -hmm. here in this country, that we were turning all of that on its head in a decade. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, I understand. And I think what, I think what happens is people think from a good place that changing something is a good thing. And when you take God out of the equation, 
it's because only God knows the end at the beginning yeah. that many of the things that we do and think are good things can actually turn out to hurt all of us, including the people that we think that we're helping. Yes. You know, yeah. how uh, I read that uh, a man named Lord Denning. Yes. Had a great role to play. Yes. In your development yes. as an attorney yes. who fights for the rights of yes. Christians. Yes. Yes. Well, it was wonderful, really, because I was very young. I was only in my twenties and really just starting out in the law. And at that time, he was the president of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. Um, but he was fearless. And there was also a man called Neville Knox and another called Val Grieve, and they were all senior, um, but took on took took me under their wing. Myself and certainly another young lady called Claire Speak, we were both there together at the time as two young lawyers. And they really developed and encouraged us to speak boldly, to speak fiercely. Lord Denning did love the Lord and he feared the Lord first and not man. And that's quite unusual uh, in many ways. I, I found it, certainly within the establishment and certainly when you're British and um, sort of the way that we express, the, when, the way that we express ourselves. And so, um, his, he encouraged me to be fearless, to be bold, to, f to fear God. And I used to have fish and chips with him once a quarter at his home when he retired, um, usually taking students, your law students to him. Right. And we used to go to a be his beautiful home in Hampshire. And he was still there, uh, his clerk, his clerk that he'd had over many years, Peter Post, used to come and welcome us. And then we'd have fish and chips together, but really talk of the things of God. So that was a wonderful thing that God gave to me when I was just 20. And of course, now I see that that was, uh, that, that was so completely the Lord doing that. Um, it was great favor. Such preparation. Yes. You know, I wanna, I wanna read a quote here. Um, in the UK, Christians are beginning to experience discrimination that leads, them, that leads to them being marginalized and losing their jobs. Over the past years, hundreds have suffered after wearing crosses to work, sharing their faith, or even offering a prayer. Why is this? Yes, it's shocking, isn't it? Yes. How can a nation forget that which is so good? Yeah, and all of those things are about expressing something that for us is about loving other people. It, it, truly, it, 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 it truly is, and it's hard to imagine that this place that has been, in, in many ways, the nation that has been emulated across the world, mm -hmm. the education systems, the health systems, the parliamentary systems, these have been um, really good, and they have been stable, and it's really because they have been rooted and founded in Christian principles and Christian precepts. And we have, uh, in a sense, in just very quickly abandoned them, really in the last half a century, yeah. uh, we've begun to abandon them. I, I think um, as a nation, we have really forgotten, as nations, yes. I should say, we've forgotten our own Christian history, yes. especially here. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, I, I speak from America, but, you know, Americans really, came, we started here. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> we started here. Right. And I studied the law, as yes. you may or may not know. Yes. And so, and part of, when I was in law school, I spent a semester here because I wanted to study yes. the English common law yes. to understand the root of our own yeah. legal system. And I was so surprised to see so much of it was rooted in Christian principles. Yes. And, you know, you often hear about this separation of church and state. That's not even, that's, com people don't even understand what that really meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just use it as this blanket statement to say, no, you can never have a Christian principle in the law. How great is the attack on our It was identity? really there to protect the freedom of Christians to, 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 to associate and to, to assemble. And actually, yes. what the, when, they, when the Founding Fathers put in uh, the First Amendment to protect religious liberty, the liberty that they understood that to be, the religion that they understood that to be, was the Christian, was the Christian faith. Yes. How... I see obviously a stripping of our identity yep. or a lack of understanding identity. What kinds of cases are you seeing that, you know, you just, you, you, you just can't believe that you're seeing? Well, I think it's, it's, there's just a line of cases over now many, many years. And I think in a sense, it's a, it, it all starts when you begin to move away from God's purposes in law and I can take it back almost 50 or 60 years. When you begin, when you introduce it into law, we can't imagine a time, for instance, in our nation when abortion uh, was 
uh, illegal, but it's only 50 years ago. And that's actually a short space of time in the span of life. Very short. Um, when no fault divorce came swiftly thereafter. So actually, again, that's a very short span of time. The sexual revolution, uh, cohabitation laws, all of these things really beginning to not protect life, personhood, from the moment of conception as something valuable to really be protected, yeah. not protecting marriage. These things are God's genesis, creator, building blocks for life. And they were dismantled in law back in the 1960s, early 1970s. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to see God's shift, God's purpose, God's gen genesis blueprint for living. That begins to be uh, disseminated, broken down. Even blasphemy, um, the blasphemy laws in our nation, it's not, it wasn't so much uh, to say that Jesus Christ's, well, it was Jesus Christ's name should be upheld, it should be protected, it should be respected. Mm -hmm. Now people would say, well, you don't, he doesn't need to be protected in law. And of course, in a sense, that's right. But what it showed at the time was who we valued in our nation. Mm -hmm. Why would you blaspheme the name of God? And, and, so, and uh, what, what, why would we not respect him? But actually that was taken away because people thought his name didn't need respecting. So we have that kind of law that's taken, um, taken away. Then we have the pushing of other laws that actually are not in sync with God's purposes and God's ways. So you begin to have um, same-sex relationship rights pushed, and actually then what you have is not just rights, individual rights, but the wholesale redefining of family. Right. And that is then protected in law as a, as, a, as a first unit, in whatever guise, whether it's a man and a woman, or a man and a man and a woman and a woman and married or not married and having children however they want that. Yeah. But if you speak against that in any way at all, if you mention that, even out of love, yeah. then you can find yourself in trouble at work. Yeah. So it's actually, so beginning to speak into those things becomes difficult. Well, that's what I find really just atrocious because, you know, we've got this whole thing and it's very Western, freedom of speech, yeah. freedom of speech. It's what a free, society is built upon, right? Well, when one person's rights to free speech are upheld, but the other person's are not, this is a problem because it's not freedom of speech. Now we're curating speech. Yes. And this, I believe, is very dangerous. And it's working, you know, it's working against Christians being able to just be open and bold about their faith. Yes. You know, when, when, look, the reality is when someone says something that I don't agree with or espouses a belief or a faith I don't agree with, I don't listen to them. Yeah. I don't understand why Christians are not afforded the same thing. Well, it is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, and th th it, it's very surprising. And, and in some ways it can only be understood in the spiritual. And, that, and, that's, and, and we do have to get to, get to get to that place to understand it. And we have to know that actually we've got to, we, we're crying out for people to come to know the Lord Jesus. And we have to understand from where some of this chaos comes. Yes. And, and, it, and it isn't consistent and it isn't fair and it doesn't make sense. But if I go back to some of our early cases, there were Christian union cases where, uh, in universities where Christian unions simply want the free, wanted the freedom for Christians to lead their Christian unions. But um, the student society would say, no, the leadership has to be open to anyone whether or not they have the Christian faith or not. Which so you, is so silly. So you, you, you should open it up to Muslims or to atheists. They should be free to lead your Christian union. And, and my question is, why would you want to lead the Christian union if you weren't a Christian? Because that means you're leading something you don't believe in. Correct. <laughs> Apart from what's strange now, so within the Church uh, of England at the moment, what we have, uh, for instance, so this is going, we're sort of fast forwarding those cases, we're back in the 2002, 2003, but actually what we have in the Church of England at the moment is a strong activist campaigning movement that says you will bless homosexual unions because you will, you're, unless you do, your theology is cruel and it's unkind and it's actually a movement of vicars and even bishops are amongst them who, is, who are saying to the ruling body of the Church of England, the general synod of the Church of England, you will accept us as we are. You will essentially wow. accept our sin. 
Um, otherwise, you are, you, are, you are the ones that are the bigoted and unkind ones. It's, there's a coercion. So it's interesting that we can say who would want to lead it. But interestingly, the Church of England have been so infiltrated at its ruling level that they are saying, we, they'll talk a language of Christ. Yeah. They'll say, we believe in Jesus. And they'll say that the only compassionate thing for you to do is to accept me as I am in my homosexuality that I want to live out because my love with my same sex partner is as strong as any other. So that's, and, and so that, that's the kind of thing. And the world out there looks at that and says, that, well, the church, the church can't agree on this either. Right. Well, and where, and where there's instability in the foundation of an institution, the institution is ineffective. You know, because I, I don't, I, in all honesty, to me, and I've had this conversation with friends of mine who are gay, who have said, I don't really want to be a part of something that by its definition is not really supportive of all that I'm doing. And I always say, well, A, Jesus wants you to be a part, period, yeah. because he loves you. But B, this is the faith. This is the faith. This is what, you know, the truth of the Bible states X, Y, and Z. And I tend to believe that God knows the end at the beginning. And so I accept all that the Bible and states. That actually it's, true. Kind, it's true. And that it's kind and good and beautiful and true for all of us right. to be a point where we, we right. to be turned away, to, to be told that we need to turn away from that, which is sinful. All of us are sexual sinners. It's, th so this is, this is the point. Yeah. And there is a way, again, there is a blueprint for living. In fact, what we've done in this country as well is we've shut down any recourse to therapy where people very often in homosexual relationships want to move away, or addictive behaviours, mm -hmm. want to move away from them. Uh, we, we're now being told uh, by the governing bodies uh, that that kind of therapy is dangerous and you won't be licensed for it. So again, what you get is a closing out of the public space for Christians to practice in that area or for that kind of practice completely. Do you think it's because the fear is that it's this kind of crazy electroshock therapy or screaming at people and, you know, stamping Satan out of them, which we've seen a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of that, you know, stuff that's been done incorrectly yeah. by Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that interestingly, that whole electric shock therapy, I'm not sure that Christians have done that. I think it was the actual main, the mainstream way of dealing with that uh, right. several decades ago. So I think that's something they like to put uh, upon us. And certainly all the people that I have met um, are very qualified, mm -hmm. very able, never force anything upon anyone, want to help people who choose who, to come to them and want to get a handle on their behavior and to move away from behavior which actually makes them very sad. Yeah. They want to live in line with their faith. They want to keep, sometimes they want to keep them, it's because they're married and they want to keep their marriage together. They want to raise their children. Yeah. And actually these are really important things that we should be helping people with. That's good and kind and beautiful. And actually it's just honest. Well, that's the, yeah. And, and herein lies the big thing. It's just, it's the, the fear of discussing these issues because of the fact that you get beaten and attacked and shamed into a place of silence is not helping anybody. Yeah. It's not helping anyone. It's not helping the dialogue and the understanding on the Christian side, and it's not helping the dialogue and the understanding on the non-Christian side of the actual people that are saying, hey, this yeah. is who I think I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. am I this person or am I not this person? You know, maybe you have questions about it, or maybe you're so afraid to ask anyone about it because you're so afraid of the ensuing battling that's going to go on over something that you feel you're dealing with. You know, I, I, I have a, a question about your organization. Yeah. Um, can you explain to us how Christian Concern actually works? And I think what we're going to do is we're going we're, we're gonna to leave you for this week. We're out of time. And we're going to come back next week and we're going to get more into Andrea Williams' story and the work of Christian Concern and why all of us as Christians should be concerned that we are being the light that we're supposed to be, that we are understanding the issues we're supposed to understand, and that we're loving people that want to paint us as very unloving and very uncaring and unconcerned about who they are and what they are. So we will be back next week. I'm Cynthia Garrett.
I really hope you enjoyed this week's session and I can't wait to be back with you next week. So I just wanted to pop in really fast and remind you to pick up a copy of Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity. It's my first book and it goes through my life and all of the things that God taught me through applying the word of God to challenges and situations and all kinds of experiences. At the end of the day, it's about finding my identity. And at the end of the day, it's from my heart that all of you would find your identity in Christ. And this book, I really believe, will help you find your identity and own your identity and walk powerfully in your identity because it's time for you to take a victory lap with Jesus as the guide. So I will see you soon. You can pick it up everywhere, online booksellers and retailers, and I hope you'll be blessed.